Your learning objectives for mastering the general survey are to assess and describe the patient's general appearance, including level of consciousness, signs of distress, apparent state of health, and facial expression, to assess the height, weight, and build of the patient, and to measure the vital signs, including the blood pressure, heart rate, both radial and apical, respiratory rate, and temperature. The general survey of the patient's appearance, height, and weight begins with the opening moments of the patient encounter. Does the patient hear you when greeted, rise with ease, walk easily or stiffly? Each observation should raise questions or hypotheses for you to consider as your assessment unfolds. The best clinicians continually sharpen their powers of observation and description throughout the patient visit. Before beginning any physical examination, elicit a careful history to clarify the patient's concerns. Common or concerning symptoms relating to the general survey and vital signs include pain, fatigue and weakness, fever, chills and night sweats, and changes in weight. Pain is one of the most common presenting symptoms in office practice. An estimated 76 million Americans report intermittent or persistent pain each year. The seven features of pain, especially severity on a scale of 1 to 10, localizing symptoms, and the psychosocial history are essential to your physical examination, assessment, and a comprehensive management plan. Fatigue is a relatively nonspecific symptom with many causes. Because fatigue is a normal response to hard work, sustained stress, or grief, try to elicit its associated life circumstances. Fatigue unrelated to such situations requires further investigation into causes such as anemia, thyroid disorder, depression, cardiac ischemia, and several others. Weakness is different from fatigue. Weakness denotes a demonstrable loss of muscle power and bears careful investigation. Question the patient as to what areas of the body are involved and any associated sensory loss or other neurologic symptoms. Fever refers to an abnormal elevation in body temperature. Ask about fever if patients have an acute or chronic illness or especially infection. Recall the seven important attributes of every symptom. These include location, that is, where is it and whether it radiates? Quality, can the patient describe what it is like? Quantity or severity, if there is pain, can the patient rate it on a scale of 1 to 10? Timing, when does it start, how long does it last, and how often does it occur? The setting in which the symptom occurs, that is, environmental factors, personal activities, emotional reactions or other circumstances that contribute to the pain. Remitting or exacerbating factors. Is there anything that makes it better or worse? And associated manifestations. Has the patient noticed anything else that accompanies it? Become familiar with patterns of infectious diseases that may affect your patient. Inquire about travel, contact with sick persons, and unusual exposures. Also ask about the use of any medications, which may cause fever. To determine any changes in weight in the patient, you might ask, How is your weight compared to a year ago? Why do you think your weight has changed? What would you like to weigh? If weight gain or loss appears to be a problem, ask about the amount of change, its timing, the setting in which it occurred, and any associated symptoms. Weight gain can reflect caloric intake or accumulation of body fluids. By eliciting the patient's concerns before the examination, you prepare for an examination that is focused, efficient, and productive. With the patient's health history in mind and after good hand hygiene, you are ready for the general survey. Through study and repetition, the examination will flow more smoothly and your technique will become more proficient. Typically, the physical examination begins with the general survey of the patient. 
This includes a parent's state of health based on observations throughout your encounter. Level of consciousness. Is the patient awake, alert, and responsive to you and others? Signs of distress. Does the patient show evidence of cardiac or respiratory difficulties, pain, anxiety, or depression? Check for changes in skin color and any obvious lesions. Look for scars, plaques, or nevi. Consider whether the patient's personal hygiene and grooming seem appropriate to his or her lifestyle, age, occupation, and stage of life. Keep in mind that these norms vary widely. But evaluate if the patient's clothing is appropriate to the setting and for the weather. For example, are the shoes run down with cutouts or holes leading to painful feet? Note the patient's hair, fingernails, and use of cosmetics, if any. They may be clues to the patient's personality, mood, and self-regard. Observe the patient's facial expression at rest, during conversation, and during the physical examination. Watch for eye contact and evaluate if it is natural, sustained, or unblinking. Or is the gaze averted quickly? Is the affect flat, suggesting depression. Odors, such as the fruity odor of diabetes or the scent of alcohol, can be important diagnostic clues. However, never assume that alcohol is the sole or even the most important cause of changes in mental status or neurologic findings. Does the patient walk smoothly, with comfort, self-confidence, and balance? Note the patient's preferred posture and whether the patient is restless or quiet. How often does the patient change position? Is there any apparent involuntary motor activity or are any limbs immobile? If possible, measure the patient's height with the patient in stocking feet. Take this opportunity to note general body proportions and look for any deformities such as kyphosis or scoliosis. Whenever possible, weigh your patients with their shoes off. Make note of any weight changes over time. Use your measurements of height and weight to determine the body mass index, or BMI. There are several ways to establish the BMI. Your electronic medical record software may do this automatically, or you may use a BMI table. The BMI is calculated by relating height in the column on the left to weight, indicated in the corresponding rows to the right. If the BMI is 35 or greater, measure the patient's waist circumference just above the hips. Risk for diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease increases significantly if the waist circumference is 35 inches or more in women and 40 inches or more in men. If the BMI is above 25, assess the patient for the additional risk factors noted here. Hypertension, high LDL cholesterol, low HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides, high blood glucose, family history of premature heart disease, physical inactivity, cigarette smoking. Patients with a BMI over 25 and two or more of these risk factors should pursue weight loss, especially if the waist circumference is elevated, seen in metabolic syndrome. Additionally, you should assess dietary intake by taking a diet history and assessing the patient's eating patterns. Assess the patient's motivation to make lifestyle changes that promote weight loss. Be prepared to provide counseling about nutrition and exercise by being well informed about strategies that promote weight loss. If the patient's BMI falls below 18.5, investigate possible anorexia, bulimia, or other serious medical conditions. Throughout the general survey, you should strive to continually sharpen your observations and your ability to describe all the distinguishing features of the patient's general appearance. Your description should be so precise that a colleague should be able to identify the patient out of a crowd of strangers. 
Now you are ready to measure the vital signs, which include blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, and temperature. Note that recent evidence suggests that home and ambulatory blood pressure measurements are more accurate than manual measurements taken in the office. These studies propose that automated office blood pressure devices that take and average the results of five or more readings help eliminate observer error and minimize white coat hypertension caused by patient anxiety. Make sure the examining room is quiet and comfortably warm. And before assessing the patient's blood pressure, take these steps to make sure the measurement will be accurate. Ask the patient to avoid drinking caffeinated beverages or smoking for 30 minutes and to rest for at least 5 minutes before the blood pressure is taken. Check to make sure the selected arm is free of clothing. There should be no arteriovenous fistulas for dialysis, scarring from prior brachial artery cutdowns, or signs of lymphedema. Palpate the brachial artery to confirm that it has a viable pulse. Position the arm so that the brachial artery at the antecubital crease is at heart level, roughly level with the fourth interspace at its junction with the sternum. The patient's arm should be supported at the mid-chest level. To measure blood pressure accurately, you must choose a cuff of appropriate size. Cuffs that are too wide or too narrow may give false readings. Here are some guidelines to help you select the correct blood pressure cuff. The width of the inflatable bladder of the cuff should be about 40% of upper arm circumference, which is about 12 to 14 centimeters in the average adult. The length of the inflatable bladder should be about 80% of upper arm circumference, which is almost long enough to encircle the arm. All blood pressure devices, whether aneroid, electronic, or hybrid, should be routinely calibrated for accuracy using international protocols. To accurately measure the blood pressure, center the inflatable bladder over the brachial artery with the arm at heart level. The lower border of the cuff should be about 2.5 centimeters above the antecubital crease. Secure the cuff snugly and position the patient's arm so that it is slightly flexed at the elbow. When using an aneroid instrument, hold the dial so that it faces you directly. To determine how high to raise the cuff pressure, first estimate the systolic pressure by palpation. As you feel the radial artery with the fingers of one hand, rapidly inflate the cuff until the radial pulse disappears. Read this pressure on the manometer and add 30 millimeters of mercury to it. Using this target for subsequent inflations prevents discomfort from unnecessarily high cuff pressures. It also avoids the occasional error caused by an auscultatory gap, a silent interval that may be present between the systolic and the diastolic pressures. Deflate the cuff promptly and wait 15 to 30 seconds. Now place the bell of a stethoscope lightly over the brachial artery, taking care to make an air seal with its full rim. Because the sounds to be heard, that is the Karatkov sounds, are relatively low in pitch, they are generally heard better with the bell. Inflate the cuff rapidly again to the level just determined, and then deflate it slowly at a rate of about two to three millimeters of mercury per second. Note the level at which you hear the sounds of at least two consecutive beats. This is the systolic pressure. Continue to lower the pressure slowly until the sounds become muffled and then disappear. To confirm the disappearance of sounds, listen as the pressure falls another 10 to 20 millimeters. The disappearance point, usually only a few millimeters of mercury below the muffling point, provides the best estimate of true diastolic pressure in adults. Read both the systolic and the diastolic levels to the nearest two millimeters of mercury. Wait two or more minutes and repeat the entire sequence. Average your readings. If the first two readings differ by more than five millimeters of mercury, take additional readings. Avoid slow or repetitive inflations of the cuff because the resulting venous congestion can cause false readings. 
Blood pressure should be taken in both arms at least once. Normally, there may be a difference in pressure of 5 millimeters of mercury and sometimes up to 10 millimeters. Subsequent readings should be taken on the arm with the higher pressure. Averaging several blood pressure measurements is best. Differences of more than 10 millimeters of mercury between the arms raise concerns of subclavian steel and aortic dissection. In 2003, the Joint National Committee on Detection, Evaluation, and Treatment of High Blood Pressure recommended using the mean of two or more properly measured blood pressure readings taken on two or more office visits for diagnosis of hypertension. For adults, the committee has defined four levels of systolic and diastolic hypertension, normal, prehypertension, stage one hypertension, and stage two hypertension. Note that either component may be high. When the systolic and diastolic levels fall in different categories, you should use the higher category. If you read low levels of blood pressure, you should interpret this reading in the light of past readings and the patient's clinical state. If indicated, assess orthostatic hypotension, common in older adults, by measuring blood pressure and heart rate in two positions supine after the patient is resting from 3 to 10 minutes, and then within 3 minutes after the patient stands up. Orthostatic hypotension is a drop in systolic blood pressure of 20 millimeters or greater or in diastolic blood pressure of 10 millimeters or greater within 3 minutes of standing or a rise in heart rate of more than 20 beats per minute. If there are weak or inaudible Karotkoff sounds, Check the placement of your stethoscope and whether you have full skin contact with the bell. Also consider the possibility of venous engorgement of the patient's arm from repeated inflations of the cuff or even the possibility of shock. To intensify Karotkoff sounds, try raising the patient's arm before and while you inflate the cuff, then lower the arm and determine blood pressure. Or inflate the cuff and ask the patient to make a fist several times and then determine the blood pressure. For the obese arm, use a cuff 15 centimeters in width or consider using a thigh cuff wrapped around the forearm, then assessing the radial pulse. When assessing the heart rate, or HR, the radial pulse is commonly used. With the pads of your index and middle fingers, Compress the radial artery until you detect a maximal pulsation. If the rhythm is regular and the rate seems normal, count the rate for 30 seconds and multiply by 2. If the rate is unusually fast or slow, however, count it for 60 seconds. The range of normal is 50 to 90 beats per minute. To begin your assessment of rhythm, feel the radial pulse. If there are any irregularities, Check the rhythm again by listening with your stethoscope at the cardiac apex. Premature beats may not be detected peripherally and the heart rate can be seriously underestimated. Is the rhythm regular or irregular? If irregular, try to identify a pattern by asking, do early beats appear in a basically regular rhythm? Does the irregularity vary consistently with respiration? And is the rhythm totally irregular? Always check an electrocardiogram if the rhythm is irregular to identify which type of rhythm is present. Next, observe the rate, rhythm, depth, and effort of breathing. Count the number of respirations in one minute, either by visual inspection or by subtly listening over the patient's trachea with your stethoscope during your examination of the head and neck or chest. Normally, adults take approximately 20 breaths per minute in a quiet, regular pattern. An occasional sigh is normal. Check to see if the expiration is prolonged, suggesting COPD. For oral temperatures, choose either a glass or electronic thermometer. When using a glass thermometer, shake the thermometer down to 35 degrees Celsius or 96 degrees Fahrenheit or below. Then insert it under the tongue, instruct the patient to close both lips, 
and wait three to five minutes. Then read the thermometer, reinsert it for one minute, and read it again. If the temperature continues to rise, repeat the procedure until the reading remains stable. Note that hot or cold liquids, or even smoking, can alter the temperature reading. So in these cases, it is best to delay measuring the temperature for 10 to 15 minutes. Electronic thermometers are increasingly replacing glass thermometers. To use this device, carefully place the disposable cover over the probe. Insert the thermometer under the tongue and ask the patient to close both lips and then watch closely for the digital readout. An accurate temperature recording usually takes about 10 seconds. Most patients prefer oral to rectal temperatures. However, taking oral temperatures is not recommended if patients are unconscious, restless, or unable to close their mouths. In these cases, rectal temperatures are advised. For a rectal temperature, ask the patient to lie on one side with the hip flexed. Lubricate the tip of the thermometer. Insert the thermometer about three to four centimeters, or one and a half inches, into the anal canal in a direction pointing to the umbilicus. Remove it after the recommended time period, then read. As opposed to this electronic thermometer, the process with a glass thermometer is the same, although you must wait three minutes to read the results. Taking the tympanic membrane temperature is an increasingly common practice and is quick, safe, and reliable if performed properly. Make sure the external auditory canal is free of cerumen, which lowers the temperature readings. Position the probe in the canal so that the infrared beam is aimed at the tympanic membrane, otherwise the measurement will be invalid. Wait two to three seconds until the digital temperature reading appears. This method measures core body temperature, which is higher than the normal oral temperature by approximately 0.8 degrees Celsius or 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Normal oral temperature in adults fluctuates considerably, with the average usually quoted as 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. It may fall as low as 35.8 degrees Celsius in the morning hours or rise as high as 37.3 degrees Celsius in the late afternoon or evening. Rectal temperatures are higher than oral temperatures by an average of 0.4 to 0.5 degrees Celsius or 0.7 to 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit. This difference, too, is quite variable. In contrast, axillary temperatures are lower than oral temperatures by approximately 1 degree, take 5 to 10 minutes to register, and are generally considered less accurate than other measurements. Many now consider pain the fifth vital sign. Adopt a comprehensive approach to understanding any pain the patient may report, listening carefully to the patient's description of the many features of pain and its contributing factors. Accept the patient's self-report, which experts state is the most reliable indicator of pain. Ask the patient to point to the pain because patients often cannot describe or localize the site of origin. Ask the patient to describe the pain and how it started and whether it is related to a site of injury, movement, or time of day. Identify the seven features of the patient's pain. Also ask about the quality of the pain, sharp, dull, or burning. Ask if the pain radiates or follows a particular pattern Ask what makes the pain better or worse. Assessing the severity of pain is especially important, and there are many scales at your disposal to help determine that, which can be used by children as well as patients with language barriers or cognitive impairment. Managing pain is a complex clinical challenge, and treatment should be multidimensional. You should strive to attain an in-depth knowledge of analgesics and behavioral and physical therapy, as well as the risk factors of possible treatments. Remember that a clear, well-organized clinical record 
employing language that is neutral, professional, and succinct is one of the most important adjuncts to patient care. Patient is of medium height and weight who appears well-groomed and has mobility issues. He is pleasant and cooperative during the examination. Weight is 220 pounds. After practice and further review of this video, make sure you have mastered the important learning objectives for the general survey of your patient.